story, Donna, it really, really inspired me because after having had a stroke at 42, I, I, I don't know exactly what he went through, but I know what I went through, and thank you for that. It's a, thank you, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful. Well, hi guys, I'm tired, how are you? Hi. Hey, do like this. Woo! Do like this. Woo! Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> if you could see me, you would see a woman sitting in a room full of boxes, packing boxes, moving boxes. You would see a woman who is like, what is going on? You would see a woman who at 9 p.m. on a particular Saturday in 20. 15, was outside with her asthmatic self packing a moving truck that I did not know I had to pack that day. If you could see me, you'd know that I was beyond tired. I was just exhausted. My head was feeling like, how did we get here? Why are we moving today? I thought we were moving next week. What happened? If you could see me, you would know that I had just started a job that I really, really like, and I really, really miss, by the way. I really, really like. You would know that I had just gotten word that my mother was near death, possibly. They didn't know what was going on with her. She was in another state. If you could see me, you would know that as I'm attempting to get to her, that I was diagnosed with a blood clot, that they say would have killed me had I made that trip in any fashion whatsoever. But that's if you could see me. You could see a woman, you would see a woman sitting on that floor saying, Lord, tomorrow Sunday, truly you cannot believe I'm going to church. No, no, we're not, that's not what we're going to do tomorrow. Not, mm -mm, not at all. And then there were other things. And finally I said, please, Lord, I cannot handle another thing. And do you know after that, there was yet another diagnosis? Is this familiar to you? Your head hurts, your chest hurts, your appetite is nil. You can't concentrate. Restful sleep eludes you. All of your thoughts are jumbled up. And you ask, what the world is, what in the world is happening? Is any of this real? Oh yes, it's real. And for me, it was my reality. But let's back things up a bit, okay? Let's talk about being disciple. If you can see me, you can see that I was a disciple. Mm -hmm. Yep, I am indeed a licensed and ordained woman of God. Uh, by the way, anybody want to get married tonight? <laughs> I'm ready. We can do that. We can do that. We can do that. Um, you would see a woman who has been in church all of her life. You'd be, I've been what I call, given the God pill. Now, mind you, I am licensed and ordained, and my faith is very important to me, but I have been given the God pill. So I knew that something was wrong. I didn't know what that was. I had no idea of what that was at all. So this is what I want you to do now. I want you to stretch out your hands like this, as though you're receiving a gift. Got it? Because tonight I'm going to give you the gift of the view of my life, of what happens when you live in this world known as mental health illness. So let's define disciple. For, all, for most of us, we know that disciple is an ardent follower or believer of something or someone, right? We can agree on that. Well, for me, I indeed was an ardent believer in my diagnosis that I didn't know I had, the undosed, und undiagnosed diagnoses. In other words, I was discipled in mental, in mental health illness. So what in the world, you ask? Y'all know I'm glad you did. So let me tell you how I You see, I was ushered into this work. Y'all get it? The church ain't ushered in. <laughs> I was ushered into my discipleship of depression and the other stuff. So after I say depression, y'all supposed to say and the other stuff, right? Okay. But I was discipled in that early on. At the age of five, I began to endure physical injustices from both genders. I began to endure domestic, seeing domestic violence happen in my home. I can still remember the day I looked up, the last day I saw my biological father. And he was coming in the door, he had been drinking. He was a highly functioning alcoholic that you would never know was an alcoholic unless you knew he was an alcoholic. He came through the door, he was 6'3", 200 plus pounds. My mother, who has never been over 4'11", she says she's 5'1", she's not. But he came in and she was cooking. 
and he started to beat her. He beat her like a dude. And then we got our dinner, right? So to this day, my family will tell you, I don't want a piece. I don't want a green pea, no matter how you give it to me. I don't want a pea. But you know why? Because I got a beating that night from my father. Because I traded my pea for potatoes. Now, I do like potatoes, you see. I like That's good stuff. <laughs> potatoes. <laughs> but as a result of that, I began to have distorted views about myself. And this highly functioning alcoholic father of mine looked at me, and I was a daddy's girl. By the way, I know y'all got your phone, so if you Google daddy's girl, you're gonna see my picture. Yes, you are. He looked at me, he came in after wrecking the company truck and said, baby girl, don't let daddy die. Guess who died two weeks later? Daddy. Guess who didn't know what death was? I had no idea. We didn't have a fish die, let alone a person, my dad. And you know what they told me? He was sleeping. Well, this young girl who didn't know any better believed that. So we, when we went to this thing called a funeral, and he was stretched out like he was in a bed, my thought was, well, wake him up. What's the problem? What is wrong with you people? <laughs> then when they closed this thing that looked sort of kind of like a bed with a tuck on it, and we went following a long distance, I was like, well, where are we going? Are you going out of town? Then they tell me my dad who was asleep. Mind you, he's asleep. Not dead, I don't know what that is, right? They tell me they're gonna put him in the ground? You're gonna do what? He's asleep, you gotta get him up, you gotta get him out! But alas, they did not. So my mother, who was 29 years old at the time with three young girls, decided to move back to her home state with these three young girls. The night before she left, I had a visitor in the room where we were. We were sleeping on the floor because all the furniture had already begun its transit to this new state. And I had a visitor in that room, right between me and my little sister. And I couldn't tell anybody, because I was told, don't tell. So I didn't. So I grew up in this world not telling anything. And my thought was, well, if, if, if I do everything you want, if, if I remain quiet, then you won't bother me. I just, I just got to do everything you want, and I got to do it perfectly. So guess what's said in this? perfectionistic tendencies. So let's roll forward a few years. And all of a sudden, I'm a teenager. I'm a budding teenager with a budding teenager's body from a family of women who are very full-spirited, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> See, we don't use plus size. We're just full-spirited. You understand? <laughs> so the physical injustices continue to go on incestuous relationships with cousins who threatened me not to tell the secret. And I can tell you standing up here today that I never had to leave the church to do my dirt. Literally and metaphorically. There were things that happened in church that should never have happened. But again, that's, that's the only world I knew. I was supposed to trust people, right? I was supposed to go to them. That's the place you go to get help. People in church were talking about me and my promiscuity, but they never talked with me. There is a difference. You talk with people, you don't talk to them. So I continued on, and at the age of 17, I was a perfect student, if you will, but at the age of 17, they tell me I have to graduate from the St. Paul High School. Anybody know what that is, mm -hmm. St. Paul High School? Okay. I broke down as I was having a midlife crisis at age 17 because I did not want to leave high school. And then I realized my mother had filled out my college applications based on my SAT score. Remember, did I say I had perfectionistic tendencies? I had A's, I had B's. I had a full ride to MIT. Oh, wow. A full ride to MIT. My family, however, my mother said, you will not go that far away from she began to talk and talk and talk. And I thought, I, I don't understand. It's just like, you know, we can catch a bus or a plane or something. You could come and visit me. No was the answer. So instead, I went to a small college where there were only 30 African-American students on campus. Mind you, my whole life. My great-grandmother is Caucasian, full Caucasian. So I do believe that we are all connected. That is my firm belief, and I stand on that. But I had been raised in an environment where I was not exposed 
So I go off to the foothills of North Carolina, of all places. This church girl goes to the foothills of North Carolina to go to school, and all of a sudden, I'm thrown into an environment. I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen so many people this color, not even my family. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do? You know? um, I made friends, and one particular friend was Joanne Sharp. And Joanne was gay. We didn't know what that term was then. But Joanne and I became very, very close. And because I'm affectionate, and members of my family are not that affectionate, I mean, I'm very, very touchy feely. So I sent to approach people and say, may I hug? Or hug? Before I suck. You know, and one day my mother just said, I know you're gay. I was like, oh, who? Y'all happy? <laughs> I'm happy. But no, you're gay. You told that girl you loved her. Let me understand. I'm 18 years old. But I am in her house, but it is her phone, technically, right? And you're listening to my phone call. Okay, all right. So I figured at that point, I could not do anything right. That was my first, that was the summer of my first suicide attempt. I planned it out well every single week. Our family went to visit my grandmother, and we didn't come home until a certain time. And this particular Saturday, I said, you know, I'll stay home. That was not unusual. I knew we had a weapon in the house. I knew where it was, and I was going to take it, shoot myself. But I was going to take it out of the house, go somewhere, lie in a ditch, and shoot myself. By the time they found me, my body wouldn't be recognized. It's no need to be here anyway. I can't please you. This stuff keeps happening to me. Well, as fate would have it because I am a woman of faith. Um, I took every, I could not find the weapon. I knew exactly where it was. Huh? Y'all know what? She moved it. She moved it. But I took every pill in the house. Every one of them. And as circumstance would have it, someone called me on the phone. And this is a day, this day, I'm telling my age now. Anybody else remember Prince's phone? All right. The, the days of the Prince's phone. And so I put the phone on the, uh, uh, the person had randomly called me, realized that something was wrong, and kept trying to get me to hang up the phone. And I wouldn't hang up. And I guess I dropped the phone. Guess who comes back in the house out of nowhere? You can talk, it's interactive, you know. <laughs> Mom. Mom comes back in the house. And when she does, she hears that, y'all remember? Yeah. 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 And she hangs up the phone and immediately rings. He says something's wrong. So there begins the story. I go into the ward. They take me to the hospital. I fight like an alligator. I do not want this black stuff they're trying to pour down my throat. I don't know what they're, they're trying to kill me. You get it? <laughs> and so they're, they're doing this and I, Stay in there, I don't even remember how long it was that I stayed in there, but I was in there. And the day I got ready to get out, my mother looked at me and said, Oh, at least you're black lady in here. Okay? I'm not even good at feeling like that. What do I do now? Where do I go now? But if you could see me, you can see that I really was an excellent mental health illness disciple. I interacted, interacted with everyone the way they wanted me to interact. You couldn't see me then, but can you see me now? If you could see me, you would see the struggles that I endured, struggling to be heard, struggling to be understood, struggling just to live. And as a person who, can anybody tell I'm an introvert? <laughs> I really am an introvert. When I leave here tonight, I'm gonna have to go back and recharge to face tomorrow. But as an introvert in the faith community, ah, I had a deck stacked against me. Because I've been speaking since I've been eight years old because that's what they told me I had to do. That I had to do that. I had to do it no matter what. Going to church was not an option in our family. It's just something you did every week. And I didn't understand why, but we did. Now think about this. I'm a woman, right? I, I hope you know, I'm full of spirit. Remember that? I'm full of spirit. <laughs> I'm a woman, I'm a woman of color, and I'm a woman in the faith community. And now you want me to tell somebody how to listen to them? Mm -hmm. you, want to, you, want, you really want me to share that secret in my culture? Because see, in my culture, we don't acknowledge that this is historically and culturally. We don't acknowledge that. We're told to pull ourselves up our bootstraps. But guess who ain't got no boots? <laughs> that would be me. I don't have boots. So it was a constant struggle. So we fast forward again to 2016. I'm now here living in Richmond, Virginia. I've gone through my second suicide attempt. 
And I'm living in Richmond, Virginia, and now I've been diagnosed with something that causes me to wake up in pain every single day. And I'm like, I'm 40 something years old, this can't be happening. It, it's what, what's happening. But if you could see me, you would know that despite all of that, everything that happened in the church, everything that happened in the community, everything that happened on my job, and everything that I did to myself, you would see it's because of my faith that I'm able to stand here before you tonight. It's because of my faith that I can keep going. If you could see me, you would know that you would clearly see the rock on which I stand and know that I am sure for the, in my faith that God did not, nor is he, punishing me. My mental health illness is not demonic. You can't catch it. I don't think so. <laughs> you can't catch it. You can't wish it away from me. It is the life I have to endure. It is my thorn in the flesh, if you will. But you know what? Had I not been properly diagnosed in 2016 when I worked for a very large hospital in this city, in a very large department in this very large hospital, for a very influential department chair in this very large department, in this very large hospital, <laughs> in this very large city, and had I not gone through all of that at that time, because it was then when I went in the hospital and every single day they kept asking, is your chest still hurting? Because it had been hurting for months. Ever since, do you remember the move at the beginning of the story? It had been constantly hurting. But the problem was I worked with these physicians and they knew me as Miss Sunshine. I literally worked with the physicians who treated me and that's all they knew. No one thought about Depression, anxiety, and what? Oh, and the uh, other stuff. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. But that's what I had. And when I went to my primary care physician, she referred me to the psych nurse who said, you have two options. Within 10 minutes, you have two options. You can go to group therapy or you can go to inpatient. I chose group therapy for $200, Alex. That's what I did. I am not going inpatient. I am not doing what in the world am I going to tell the church? I can't do that. I'm a leader in the church. I'm an elderess in the church. That really is not a term like, don't, don't yeah. tell me about it. Let me correct that before that gets out, you know. But the reality is that I bumped up against my own personal stigma that I didn't even know I had. I was helping people almost on a daily basis with their challenges, but I didn't know I had this personal bias about me. Because remember, I'm the P word perfectionist. And when you're dealing with depression, anxiety, and yes, I sing too, and so do you. Yes, 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 yes. You don't, you just, you just don't talk about that. You just don't talk, you just don't do it. But I did, and it was there I learned that I'm not alone. It was there I came to realize that I'm not abnormal, I'm not disabled, I might be differently able. I still have the stellar skill set as an executive, a senior executive assistant that I've always had. I just can't go in at six o'clock in the morning, knock out a million reports, and then come back and do this every day. So I can do that differently, hence differently able. I cannot allow myself to take on someone else's reality when I'm still trying to face my own. I cannot allow myself to feel so deeply for others when I've yet to feel my own pain to the depths that I need to feel it. But you know what I can do? I can tell you my story. Because perhaps in my story, you will see yourself. Perhaps in my story, you will see someone else. Perhaps in my story, you would know that the person beside you is dealing with something, and they are just crying out for help in whatever manner they can do so. So if you could see me, you would see that being disciple in depression and the other side. I love this, has led to a life that is unfolding in the most amazing ways. Oh my goodness, if I had not been diagnosed and come public, because see my mantra now is, I wanted to stop being sick in secret and be perfected in public. Your secrets keep you sick, and I'm no longer willing to do that. And I had I not taken that stance for me at that time, then I would not have met so many amazing people on this journey of recovery and mental health illness. I would not have met my co-presenters, and I definitely wouldn't have met Aaron. And guess what? I wouldn't have met you. 
And I think that's an honor that you have allowed me to come into your presence tonight. Because without this diagnosis, I wouldn't know just how strong I was. Without this diagnosis, I wouldn't come to realize how resilient I really am. Without this diagnosis, depression, anxiety, and love. I would not be who I am today. So it just means, as I said before, that I'm now differently able to show up in this world. If you can see me, you can see that I am empowered and stretched to make an impact on this world that is totally unique, that is totally TLC. <laughs> you would see that this is my destiny. And in the words of a songwriter, the song says, I know what I'm here for. I leave you with this, referencing Esther 414. Remember, I'm a church lady, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the voice translation. It says, perhaps I've been made queen for such a time as this. And finally, if you could see me, then perhaps you could see yourself. Thank you. Oh.